Very good morning, and you're welcome to today's Signpost webinar coming to you on a beautiful summer's slash autumn's day here in the west of Ireland. Uh, a welcome relief, I'm sure, for many of the tillage farmers across the country who are getting the last of the, the harvest in this week. And uh, I do hope that uh, some of you got to enjoy the, the ploughing this week as well. For, uh, and Jagus, we're delighted to welcome uh, thousands of visitors to our exhibits there at, at the ploughing with lots of uh, interesting questions as always. Uh, so we hope you enjoyed your, your visit. So uh, to move on to uh, today's presentation, uh, we're delighted to be joined by Sinead Grimes, who is the project manager of the uh, North Connemara locally led Agri-Environmental Scheme, or I should have said past tense, was the project manager because the project has since ended uh, in March 2023. Uh, it, it's a European Innovation Partnership uh, and it's a, uh, integrated local farmers with individuals from the agri-food industry to tackle the decline of economic and social viability of farming uh, in this environmentally important area of Ireland. And uh, Sinead, you're very good to join us and uh, share some of the outcomes from the project. Um, and we're also joined by Dr. Catherine Keena, who is our countryside management specialist in Chagas, uh, who is, I know has been working closely with uh, that project and many other operational groups across Ireland. And uh, Catherine, delighted to have you uh, to assist us with the, the questions later on. Um, and hopefully we'll have a bit of a discussion about this project and maybe uh, the implications for, for other projects around the country. So Sinead, maybe before we start into your presentation, you could tell us a little bit about the, the work that you're uh, doing uh, now and, and, and even uh, sure. what brought you to being involved in that uh, project. Yeah, and first of all, thanks a million, Mark, and also to Catherine and Yvonne behind the, the scenes there. It's great to get this opportunity because as I was saying to Catherine earlier, sometimes you know, you put the head down and you're doing the work and you don't get the chance to actually um, share the knowledge and share, you know, the experiences of, of what, what we actually achieved. Um, so, yeah, how did I come into this? Um, a, a little bit of an accident, <laughs> really. Uh, it was really being project managed by Joseph Mannion. Um, Joseph worked on this for two and a half years, so... Really, most of what I'm presenting today, the kudos for all of that would go to Joseph. Uh, I took over then for the last six months of the project. Um, I was already running an EIP on farm health and safety. So I was I knew the farmers. I knew the uh, the run of things. I've been helping Joe and Kathy. Kathy Connolly was the, um, um, the, uh, the person who helped Joseph do the habitat service. She was the ecologist on, on the project. Um, so really, I fell into the role. Uh, so I think Joseph was very smart and left with me to do the, the final report and all the paperwork. So he, he got out at the right time. <laughs> but it was ask. hugely yeah. interesting. So I, I don't blame him. It was, it was a great thing to be involved in. It was yeah. a really great Brilliant. experience. Great, great. And just, I mean, in case, I'm, I'm, you're sure you're, pro you're covering it in your presentation, but mm. for, for those who are new to this concept of EIPs, maybe could you just tell us what, what what's, the, what's the concept? First off, I think if anybody out there is thinking of going for an EIP, I would heartily recommend that you do. Um, across everything from the experience of setting it up, um, meeting with the farmers, getting the steering group committee. It's it's hugely positive. And I think um, the the benefits to the local economy and the local community are like, there's there, it's very holistic. It's not just in one area. Um, there's great flexibility in them as well. Um, and, you know, when you're running as a pilot, you have the flexibility to test out the waters and, and maybe... Just to see if something works where sometimes if you get funding in other areas it, you know your your role is more strict you can't go outside of that and um, if you commit to something you have to stay on course and do it even if you're finding part way through them, well this isn't working and i yeah. think that's as much um an important finding of these eips that uh you see what works and what doesn't work and when something doesn't work, it's not a failure. Like you're you're finding Absolutely. out, you're gathering yeah. more knowledge in that. So that space for discovery along the way, which exactly. is exactly really yeah. Powerful. And the EIPs are a great tool for that. This is... Again, the locally led aspect of mm -hmm. these is what really works. Yes, yes. 
Brilliant. Okay. Well, uh, I'm sure we'll learn more about the uh, the details uh, through your presentation. So, um, if I could ask you to share your screen and uh, while you're doing that, just remind everybody if you don't know by now, uh, the all of our presentations and recordings are available on the Chagas website. If you want to go directly to the uh, the, the recording, it's available on the Chagas YouTube channel. And also a podcast version of today's uh, webinar will be available in the coming days. Uh, it just is handy for if you want to catch it on the move um, or listen to it um, on, while you're traveling, yeah, the, that, that uh, is available to you as well. So on all, all podcast platforms. So um, Sinead, we'll hand over to you. Uh, looking forward to your presentation and uh, we'll, we'll uh, take questions from our audience afterwards. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks a million, Mark. Um, I'm, I, I do, do have a, a good few slides here, but I will power through them and I'm going to do the speed talking now. Um, so as I mentioned here, Joseph Mannion and Cathy Connolly were the um, project manager and project ecologist for the first two and a half years of this. So most of what I'll be sharing today was done under their watch. Um, I then joined for the last six months. So uh, and I, I should go back to that. I think we deserve a prize for the longest name of an EIP ever. So instead of saying that full title, I'll just call it the Enclis. That's the, the um, North Connemara locally led agri-environmental scheme. Uh, the lead applicant was Forum Connemara. Um, so that's who, who I'm employed by, a former community development company in the west of Ireland. Um, we would deliver several programs, including the leader, SICAP, um, and we have a social enterprise. We run the uh, labour activation program. So the EIP just sat nicely in that um, we were already well established in the area, and um, we we had good relationships there with the farming community. Um, so what were the aims and object uh, aims and objectives? Sorry. So the main aim was uh, to tackle the decline in the economic and social viability of farming in this. Um, you know, hugely environmentally important area of Connemara. And again, it was important to us to use a ground up approach. Uh, everything we did had to be sustainable. It had to be practical and achievable. Um, we also had, you know, the secondary aims of uh, Im improving communication, knowledge sharing, and um, most importantly, again, to, to improve the uh, ecologically sensitive area to improve the biodiversity in this area. We couldn't have done this without our, our steering group. Uh, we were very, very lucky to have a, a, a you know, very engaged group with a wide range of skills from, uh, and we were delighted to have yourself, Catherine, on, on the board and also Ivan Kelly. Um, but it was great to have like uh, farmers who were really kind of leaders in the community as well. We had Brendan Joyce, Eamon Nee, and Martin Gavin from the NAN. Um, they worked well and it was with the farmers and Joseph and Cathy and the steering group who really came up with the initiatives that, that we took on. So we uh, operated in, um, uh, there was two special areas of conservation. Um, and the, uh, the at the start, we had took on 96 participants. Um, and this increased just to 115 in 2022 by the, the end of the scheme. Um, sorry, it's getting a bit bigger and happy here. Uh, just to say, like, this is the area that we operated in. And when you look at that, some of these place names are iconic, you know, and, and I think when people think of Connemara, uh, you know, automatically you're going to think of the peatlands, the mountains, the, the wild coastline. And Connemara, no doubt, it is a very beautiful place, but there's more to it than its scenery. It's it's a hugely important area for biodiversity. Um, you have the um, native woodlands here in very clear. You have the mock air uh, habitats along the coast. Um, it's one of the last places in Ireland you'll hear the Corn Creek. Um, and there's remaining populations of the freshwater pearl mussel. But Equally as important as, as that biodiversity are the people and their way of life in this area. And I think this EIP sought to encompass all of that. And I think, I'm happy to say, I think we did. Uh, there was challenges. Um, the, the main challenges for us were, um, you know, there are low farm incomes 
in hill farming. Uh, to put this in context, we did a survey of up to a uh, hundred farmers before we started. Ninety three percent of the farmers were hill farmers. Eighty eight of those were were um, sheep farmers, and sixty eight percent had second jobs. So we were working with people who were time poor, um, and and that's why everything that we try to implement had to be <clears throat> achievable within a, a certain time frame and a certain cost. Um, the fact that it is upland farming, there's reduced land as well uh, for the farming and animal management is, is hugely important in that. Again, another challenge was the absence of up-to-date habitat information. If we're starting trying to improve biodiversity, we have to know where we're starting from. Uh, so uh, that's something that we sought to address. Again, just that this was a three-year project, uh, while it might seem a long time, it, it's not actually a lot uh, when you have to measure the changes that, that you've put in place. Um, so how did we get about this? Well, the first thing we undertook was habitat surveys. Um, th this project, uh, even when I say it started in May 2019, um, and we operated through COVID times, so uh, there was a lot uh, that we couldn't do. But thankfully, walking in Connemara in that time was one of the things we could do. So Cathy and Joe went out and they surveyed 10,000 hectares of um, the, the farmlands in Connemara during that time. I, I will cover that a little bit later. Uh, these surveys then led to uh, suggestions for improvements in biodiversity on each of those areas. Uh, we also tackled um, what started out as a sheep scheme, like a sheep improvement scheme. But uh, as I say, 88 percent of our farmers were, were sh sheep farmers. So we had to add something for the other 22. So in, in 2021, we added um, cattle and equine to the livestock improvement um, scheme. We did group management, which we, by that we mean training and workshops. Uh, this was hugely important if you think of us coming out of COVID, we really needed something to uh, engage farmers and add a whole social element to the, to the scheme. Um, thankfully, that worked really, really well. And the training especially went down very well with the farmers. Uh, community involvement. We, we looked and we knew that, you know, farmers don't operate in isolation. Uh, no man is an island. And unless we brought the community along in addressing some of these issues, um, we, we would be doing the farmers a disservice. So we worked with the schools, we worked with the Tidy Towns group. Um, and again, I, I'll cover that a little bit later. One of the main areas, um, and uh, thankfully an area that we're continuing to work on in Form Connemara is the invasive species control. Uh, for uh, Connemara, rhododendron ponticum was seen to be the main threat. Um, and again, I'll go into detail on, on how we tackle that and how we're continuing to tackle that. Uh, as I alluded to earlier, the people were as important in this EIP as, as anything else. And um, we did decide to, and this was a change as well. It wasn't in our original plan, but it came about, um, I was speaking to a farmer and he, he was worried, you know, that it, when his dad passed on, that the knowledge he had of like the name of that hill or that valley, that that would go with them. And he put it in a lovely way. He said, and I don't know if this is his phrase or not, but he said, when you lose an elder, you lose a library. And talking to Joe, we decided, yeah, that this is really something that we want to concentrate on. And we did a little um, heritage gathering, a series of videos, and we put them up on a Facebook page. Um, I'll, I'll present on that a little later. And because this is an EIP, innovation was at the forefront. We did... Um, try to include a lot of innovation in this. So again, I have a few slides on that later. Um, as an overall picture, um, this is just a slide I did for the gathering of the EIPs. I think it was in, I think it was at loan. Uh, so it's a little out of date, but just it'll give you a picture of what we did. Um, so the habitat service, as I mentioned, 10,000 hectares were, were surveyed and uh, 200 plant species were uh, recorded in, in that time. Um, and from that, the habitat improvement came. We covered training. We did um, training with over over 250 farmers, um, ranging from sheep sharing, grown usage, pesticide and chainsaw skills, among others. 
group meetings were, were just as important. And this is where we really listened to the farmers. Uh, we wanted to know what was worrying them, what did they feel they could improve on, where did they need extra knowledge. So, for example, we would have got a vet to talk about um, dosing and animal safety and handling, and we got a financial expert to talk specifically on farm finances. Um, the community engagement, as I mentioned, we, we talked with the schools and ran uh, programs in the primary and secondary schools and um, the tidy towns. Um, the, the next one down there says blackface sheep. And again, this is what I was um, talking about earlier. The, the beauty in the EIP is its flexibility. We started off with blackface sheep as the initiative because blackface sheep would be the best um, breed really for the uplands. But a, as we worked with the farmers, we realised, you know, we did need to expand that into other breeds of sheep as well as um, a, a, a cattle and equine. Um, the targeting invasive. So uh, at the time of writing this, we had a team of six operatives who were employed directly by the EIP. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm really proud to say that has expanded and um, I, I'll cover that later. So just to get into each of these then in a little bit more detail, the habitat service. Um, this was important to create a baseline of data so that we could um, see where we were starting from and make um, arrangements with the farmers on how each of their plots um, could be improved for biodiversity. Uh, there was a bespoke habitat scorecard created. It, now, it's too unwieldy to put on a nice slide. I know people might be interested in seeing that, but if, if you imagine a large spreadsheet with 200 species on it, um, it didn't make for a pretty slide. But uh, just to maybe explain how it was done, um, the surveys were done yearly. Uh, this plot would be walked in a W shape and you would uh, just note all of the species you would see. We use the DAFOR scale, D-A-F-O-R. Um, and as we walked, we would see um, what species were dominant. That's the D. Um, so that would be a species that would cover two thirds of the plot, for example. Abundant, anything that would be um, a third of, of the plot. So everywhere you look, you see this plant. Um, frequent then would be everywhere you look, you see some of this. Occasional, you, you don't have to search too hard to find it, but um, you, you will spot it. And rare means um, it's only recorded a few times, maybe even once during the survey. It doesn't necessarily mean a rare plant. Um, so that was done. Um, one of the interesting things that we found during the habitat surveys was that 15% of the area surveyed had invasive species on it. So I think that, you know, that is an important finding. Um, the last two points there, equally as important as getting a baseline was starting the conversation with farmers and sharing the knowledge on, say, say for example, why is rhododendron a threat? Why should we be removing it? Uh, from the area and, and why any monoculture should be managed. So that, that was as important really as getting the baseline. The habitat surveys then led to habitat improvements. Um, so again, nothing was ever forced on any of the farmers. Uh, we worked with them, you know, shoulder to shoulder, deciding what what they could implement based on the time and and uh, you know the availability um, of um, the, the stock um, and agreement from neighbours. Again, I, I'll cover that in a little. Um, so the farmers could choose to improve their farm in infrastructure, such as fixing fences, gates, water troughs or sheep pens. And these improvements made farming easier. Uh, it helped the farmers better manage their stock and ensured the animals were safe or easier to handle and maybe kept away from some important areas of biodiversity. Um, we also did breeding, um, like control stock placement. I will cover that in more detail. The use of technology was important here as well. Uh, for example, GPS shepherding was one of the things we trialed and monoculture control. So uh, we did identify areas that needed to have um, any one particular dominant species addressed. So you can't talk about Connemara or any EIP in Connemara without addressing commonage. Um, over 75% of the farmers on the scheme operated on commonage lands. Uh, and 
we, we were lucky mostly, but completing any action in Commonage can be uh, challenging due to multiple stakeholders. Um, because of that, we treated each farmer as an individual and allowed them to choose what they wanted to implement uh, and where they had the necessary permission. It wasn't fair to um, penalise a farmer uh, if we told them to do something and they couldn't because of lack of agreement. So we, we ensured that that wasn't the case and to encourage collaboration Farmers received one and a half times um, the original incentive when working with other common shareholders. I suppose to give an example of that with fencing, um, if you fenced on your private land, you got a payment of five euros per meter. But if you fenced or repaired fences on um, a common area, you would get eight euros per meter. So that approach was successful. It brought farmers together to improve shared boundaries, uh, fences, infrastructure. Um, and that actually led to the strategy of using sheep breeding patterns to influence their placement on the hill. When a fence couldn't go in, uh, maybe we could still influence where the flock would uh, graze on, on the upper heights in, in the hills. Um, before I go on, I, I, I'll talk a little bit more about that, the, the sheep placement. Um, but I just wanted to give a, a you know, concrete example of how the payments were made. Um, equally as important as all the work on the ground is the work that gets done in the office with the paperwork. And this was what we would have had to keep per farmer. And this was what we would have had to um, produce and present back to the Department of Agriculture. And actually, I just want to say thanks. The, the, the department were so easy to work with. They really gave help when we needed it. They were flexible when we needed them to be flexible. Um, it, it, you know, it was a pleasure working with them. So here, this is an actual farmer score. Um, uh, this this is what uh, the, the track of their payments for uh, this particular year, I think it's 2022. Um, so here, this farmer chose to do um, fencing as his habitat improvement. And this would have been, you know, agreed with us. You can see here, he, uh, his habitat score, he was getting an average of 80 on, on his um, plots that were, were um, had the surveys done on them. Uh, one of the things he needed to improve on was the rhododendron control. Um, we suggested he put fencing down at the shoreline. Um, so the area to be fenced was 565 meters at five euros per meter. That came to you know over our max payment, so the maximum payment which we would have come to for, from our budget was two thousand four hundred uh, at eight hundred euros per annum. So he was over that. So he he would have got eight hundred euros per annum to go towards the fencing. You can see there that's uh, down as his farm improvement. The booklet there at the bottom refers to um, the sheep scheme. So he would have been involved in that as well. And um, he would have received a payment of 800 euros to keep a booklet a detailing um, what what he was doing for herd improvement uh, there. The habitat survey, he would have got 783 euros for that. Now, this wasn't all the payments he would have got, maybe payments for a group um, scheme as well. But just to give you a, an overview of this is how the results based payments tie back to all of these initiatives. Um, the next screen here, this shows exactly uh, how this farmer got his payment for the uh, habitat survey. So he had six plots, they were surveyed. This was the payment for 2022. Um, out of the six plots, you can see, you know, he, he is scoring high. Rhododendron would be the reason that he was he, he had lost any points there. His so overall score was uh, 78.33. We multiply that by 10 and that gave him the payment for uh, 783. We actually owe him 33 cents so I'll have to go back. Uh, fencing, as I uh, mentioned, was one of the most popular habitat improvements that the farmers did. So you can see there, you know, um, don't bother reading it out. You can see yourself the amount of fencing that was done. So much was done on hills, so much by roadside. And again, it's not just about putting putting up fences. A lot of them were repaired, which you know is of benefit to the farmers, especially on commonage areas as well. Um, those pictures, I was going to apologise for them being a bit fuzzy, but these were taken by the farmers and sent into us as, as proof um, that the fencing was done, and we would have ground proofed a lot of this as well. 
Uh, just to concentrate a bit on the Blackface Sheep um, initiative, which, as I said, increased, uh, expanded in, into uh, the sheep scheme and in 2021, cattle and equine. The idea behind this was really to Im increase um, productivity, the health of the flock, its marketability. Um, by that we mean that we would have um, encouraged people to uh, sign up to board BIA. The use of technology in uh, drone shepherding and GPS shepherding was was used and we would have trained people in that. And um, it is great to see. I was actually talking to the farmer who used the GPS shepherding um, and I met him in Oak Gerard. He was able to show me on a screen where, uh, you know, the flock was on the screen um, just miles away. And he said, yeah, it's, it's working really, really well. Um, the hill system. We kind of went back to, um, you know, the, the traditional methods, but with the new technology uh, to, to assist that. Um, but the, the hill system works. We just wanted to um, ensure that uh, people were following the best practice. The group management, um, this again, as I said earlier, was a very important after coming out of COVID. Um, we wanted to ensure that we, were, we had an excuse to bring people together. We didn't need an excuse. Um, people came out and met and it was great. I think sometimes if we had a workshop, the cup of tea afterwards was nearly longer than the workshop. Um, so during that time, we would have delivered sheep sharing, horticulture, animal handling, skills, dosing, uh, the drone techs, uh, pesticide and chainsaw. I think I have a slide yeah, here. This will show you exactly what was delivered and when. And you can see there that this initiative was impacted by COVID. Um, we couldn't really get started onto this. I think the first one there is number eight, the rhododendron control, which was outdoors uh, in October 2020. So thankfully, we did more than make up for uh, the late start. Uh, you can see how many people were trained there. And you can see from this, the most popular were the rhododendron control, the pesticide application and the chainsaw. I suppose it's actually just worth pointing out there that Sometimes people got more than just the training. They did get the social side of things, but just number one there, the electric sheep sharing. George Graham, uh, I'm sure many of the listeners will um, will know him. George is great. He'll address um, depression and suicide awareness at the same time. And when you're talking shoulder to shoulder to farmers about that, I think that really has an impact. Um, so again, it's great to have somebody like George uh, on board. Community involvement, um, I kind of already covered this. Very, very important to include the community in your EIPs if you are if you are going down that route. Um, social media had been uh, one of the ways that we would have got the word out there. We also did a radio show on community, uh, Connemara Community Radio. Um, thanks to Catherine, she was one of the people that I interviewed there for um, that show. But it was an important way of getting the message across. Uh, I've mentioned this already, we had this aspect of gathering the heritage um, and, and in 2022, we added this initiative. So this was the Connemara Rural Heritage Gathering and Recording. Um, it it was just, um, you know, the discussions with the farmers we, we were having in, on, in the field by the roadside to just reveal such a rich farming history um, and we just wanted to capture that. So, so this project gave a, a glimpse into the lives of Connemara farmers and from agri, ecological to socio-cultural. Uh, the Facebook page is still active there. And um, I just have on the next slide, just this will give you an idea of some of the, the people who engaged. And a huge thanks to Lainey Mannion and Lisa Kane, who carried out these interviews, and to everyone who took part. You have uh, Mikey up there at the top with the hands he's describing building haycocks and the couple below just discussing life and social um, interactions and how they changed next to them there. Joe Kane, he covered um, traditional hill farming methods um, and above him there, Daniel um, Barty, he was talking about um, filming. He, he was there, the filming of the field. And if you ever want to know how they did that scene where the cows jump over the cliff um, it might ruin a trade, but you, you can watch that video. I won't spoil it. Um, invasive species. This uh, is something that I, I'm delighted to say we're still working on. Uh, rhododendron was identified as the most 
uh, invasive, it's the most common invasive in Connemara. Um, we worked with Quilcha National Parks and the Wild Atlantic Nature Life IP um, to, to tackle the problem. As part of the EIP, we initially started training farmers to tackle it on their own lands and we would pay them, they submitted timesheets and we would pay them further time. I think 48 farms took um, took on that initiative. Um, the picture here just explained that this is how uh, we would treat it. It's called the stem treatment method. So each of the stems of the rhododendron would have to be uh, marked either with, this was done with the chainsaw, so it's scraped with the chainsaw. Uh, you can equally do it with a drill or a hatchet. And once you've that scraping done, it's important to apply pesticide, sorry, herbicide, um, as soon as possible. Um, and uh, you can see there, we, we actually uh, add a blue dye to the mix so that it, you can clearly see where it's been uh, applied. We would do it with the handheld applicator in a jet stream, not a mist, so there's no collateral damage. Uh, this was very important to us so that we'd make sure that we weren't creating a problem by addressing another. So again, an ecologist would come and uh, ensured before and after pictures and that the, there was no collateral damage on the, mo the mosses or grasses that were grown at the base of, of the plants. It was hugely successful. Um, however, we also saw that it, this method of controlling it was not going to work fast enough because the farmers already had enough on their plate with their, um, you know, a lot of them had the second uh, job as well. So uh, at this time, we uh, made contact with a group in Lenan that were led by Martin Gavin, and uh, he was working with the Wild Atlantic um, Make Your Life IT. And he had a team of five operatives working with them, and they were self-employed, um, and it, that was working very well. Um, it worked out so nicely that when their funding was drying up, we had uh, a funding available. So we worked with them and we took on their five operatives and another five with them. And we trained them up in chainsaw and herbicide use, pesticide use. Um, so we had 10 operatives then. And uh, over 16 weeks, we went to 16 farmers. Each farmer got a week of this crew of 10 lads with chainsaws um, and they did incredible, incredible work. Um, this was a brilliant way to tackle a problem. It was a local solution to a local ecological problem, creating 10 well-paid um, uh, you know, jobs, uh, which I'm delighted to say, is, is, there are all of those lads in the picture there, they're still with us and we actually have 20 on our team today. How did we do it? Uh, as I said, it's stem treatment. So making several cuts in the base and applying the herbicide mix as soon as possible. Stump treatment was also a method where we'd uh, cut at the base and apply the herbicide then to the stump face. Dilution would depend on the size and severity of the infestation, um, seven or 10 to one for uh, the, large, the large plants and 20 to one for the smaller plants. Um, as I say, it was very successful. Um, the team of operatives covered 123 hectares in 16 weeks. Um, in total, then, uh, I say approximately 50, but it is 48, uh, had 323 hectares done as a result of this initiative. Now, while that's fantastic, if you remember what I said earlier, that of the um, 10,000 hectares surveyed, 1,500 hectares had invasives. So you can see that there's still a lot of work to do and it, it needed to continue at a, a larger scale. And I'm glad to say this, this is the project I'm working on um, at the minute with the 20 operatives. Um, it's funded by the National Parks via the Wild Atlantic Nature Life IP. <coughs> Excuse me, it's in its second year. Um, and currently we have 20 operatives and four um, support and admin workers. Um, we work in three SACs and uh, we control invasive rhododendron in uh, Mayo and Galway. Um, the, the SACs are the Mwilri, Sheffrey, Erif Complex, the 12 Benz Garn Complex and Connemara Bog Complex. So we're now working in um, areas of Mayo and north and south Connemara. You can't talk about uh, EIPs without covering innovation. And I'm just watching the time here, so I'm going to um, 
race through the, the next few slides. Um, towards the end of the scheme, uh, we did uh, add some extra initiatives. Um, one of the farmers just said to me, Sinead, if you can come up with something to do with wool and rushes, we're all going to be millionaires. So uh, we kind of went away and, and thought about that. And um, at the time, there was an EIP making biochar from rushes. So we went down to the Burnley Carey in, in Clare and we wondered, how can we incorporate this into our EIP? Because, uh, as I said to Bernard, we have all the biomass in Connemara. You can see it here in the form of um, dead rhododendron. So we built this kiln. Uh, we were lucky that there was a student from uh, America visiting Letterfrack at the time who had knowledge of this. And one of our operatives was a welder. So it just happened very, um, th there was a nice synergy there. Uh, so we built this kiln. It's one of it, it's the only one of its type in Ireland. Um, the idea behind this was we wanted to bring this into the field where the biomass was, not the other way around. We wanted it to be light enough to be able to be towed behind a a, a, a truck, possibly a quad. Um, so this was made especially uh, for this purpose. We've made <clears throat> biochar from uh, the rhododendron brush, and we're currently getting that tested. Um, the test will just show how much carbon is locked in that um, and and how how good a quality it is so that it can be used. Um, the I, Again, I have another slide a little uh, to explain a bit more about biochar. With regards to wool, we came up with um, an idea that it was being used in Fermanagh um, and there was a lady in England using wool as um, for bog restoration. Uh, currently, in bog restoration, they would use coir logs, and these coir logs are made with coconut um, husks, <clears throat> and these are shipped from India and Sri Lanka. And I was thinking, how does that make sense? The carbon footprint of bringing them over so that we can sink carbon just doesn't make sense, really. Whereas we could use a local uh, product in a local restoration um and that hopefully would put more value on the wool. We actually also have um, secured funding via the Dula project to explore this as well as other initiatives, um, such as we're, we're making a solid material from wool um, with the bioresin. And again, hopefully we're going to, it, it, the, this material will be like the fiberglass. Uh, it will be an alternative to plastic. And the, the funding we got um, is to use this as an alternative to plastic dams in bog restoration. And that would be just one of the uses. Um, so we currently have uh, testing in place for that. Just a little bit more about the, the biochar. So what is biochar? It, it is just a, a form of carbon. Um, so instead of burning it and making ash and releasing all of the carbon into the, the air, what biochar is, um, you, you bake it really, the, the, the scientific term is pyrolysis. Um, and that means um, burning in the absence of oxygen. So um, if you can even see there, there's a, you know, a black log in this kiln. You can just start to see traces of white there. That This is what we would watch for. And when we see traces of white, that means oxygen is getting in. That's when we need to top load again and put in small sticks so that the, it's called flame cap kiln. So the burning is at the top and the baking is all of the larger um, the logs at the bottom. That's how you, how you make it. Um, the uses for this product are multi. Uh, it can be used as fertilizer, it can be used for water filtration, and one tonne of biochar equates to three tonnes of carbon sequestration. So literally you're taking the carbon out of the carbon cycle. It's the most stable form of carbon you can get and that can be put back and incorporated into the soil. It's a soil improver um, and it aerates the soil. So this is perfect for um, addressing the compaction of the soil under uh, heavily infested areas of rhododendron. So if we treat the rhododendron and leave it standing, that's only part of the problem. Without addressing the soil uh, condition underneath that, we can't replant. So again, this is um, hopefully a nod towards actually addressing this problem further down the line. Uh, the way that we made this kiln, again, had to address um, just labour efficiency, because uh, we're aware farmers don't have eight hours to stand looking at a fire. You know, So a three-person crew, crew in four hours can make 1.25 tonnes of biochar. 
And that is actually more than um, some of the more advanced uh, extra retorkins. Uh, just to go through, this is again a little bit more just to show you the biochar when it's finished. The um, This image up here is the biochar under a microscope and you can see the, the pores. And it's in these pores that all the microbiomes will live and that's what improves the condition of the soil. Uh, on the wool usage and research, these are the coir logs I spoke about. Um, and um, we're hoping to replace it with our own uh, version of this as, as wool. I'll just show you. It doesn't look like much, uh, but this is a before and after picture. So that simply is sandbags, three sandbags stuffed with wool and stuffed in a bag. Nothing more scientific than that. But when you see the difference, um, this, this can show you how it can trap the water in the bag. That's all we want to do, slow down the flow of water on the bag so that the sphagnum moss and, and grasses can catch hold and they will grow faster um, in this. Innovation, I've kind of already uh, mentioned the use of the GPS shepherding. Um, I'm going to fly through the, the rest of these slides. Uh, the achievements, so over the three years, what have we achieved? Um, we engaged 115 farmers in the conversation about biodiversity and improving habitats. It created employment for 13 full-time staff, two part-time. There was additional income for the local uh, participating farmers and communities, the habitat surveys, um, control of invasive species, training of local farmers, um, again, workforce development, uh, raising awareness and uh, improving farm productivity through the livestock management. And again, the whole holistic impact of all of that together um, it did have a, a good effect on, on the local community. Uh, I'll skip over that. that. That was just a little extract from the final report. It basically says the same thing. Just the finance. About how a minute much left, did we get? Uh, Sinead. What's that? Uh, if, if you could wrap up in a minute, it would be great yeah, uh, because we, have, exactly. we, we would like to get through some questions. Yeah, um, 1.4 million was the overall um, budget. And uh, I guess this slide just shows that the majority of that did go back into the farmers' <clears throat> pockets. Um, again, quickly, our findings. Livestock as biodiversity tools, really sheep and cattle uh, are ecological tools if used properly. Um, and farmers should be rewarded for using best practice, using the rotational grazing. Um, locally led approach works uh, of that survey, we did 99% agreed that the locally led um, results based payment scheme works. Um, the locally led schemes are better able to focus on local areas and specific problems in an area and um, I think, yeah, I'll just skip to the last one there. Farmers are interested in the locally led approach and I think they welcome the opportunity to try out actions on the farm and to learn new skills. So um, that's it really. I, I think the, the whole thing we would take away from this again is giving ownership back to the farmer, working together. The ground up approach really does get things done and to bring the community along with you, including um, the, the, the young, uh, young farmers for tomorrow. Um, that's it. I think the last slide there just kind of shows the progression. That it's the same logo from uh, uh, it's the the primary school competition there to an EIP to uh, a project that's really of national importance now. So I think that's it. Thank you, Sinead. Um, what a, what a wonderful project. I mean, it really uh, sounds like you you took a, a very holistic approach. I know you've used that word a few times throughout the presentation. But, you know, you're not just looking at one particular aspect in isolation. And I suppose it recognizes that, you know, these are complex systems and, uh, you know, where people are interacting with the landscape and uh, you have to look beyond just one narrow part of, of that of that system. Uh, I really like the way that you're, you know, you're looking at building that capacity amongst the farmers as well. That's uh, the training programs that you've offered as well. So. Look, it is, it's just a really inspirational project and uh, congratulations to you and the team on, on uh, delivering as much as you did in a relatively short period of time. So it's, yeah. uh, it's, it's <clears throat> and, and again, I, I do have to say the team were excellent, like Joseph Mannion um, and Cathy Connolly would have done the bulk of this. So uh, I, I did hope that Joseph would be here today, but he's actually working with the Acres scheme now. So 
He's oh, a busy okay. man. Yes, yes. yes. So um, just, a, a, I suppose, a, a general question before we get into the, the main questions. And I know we, we do have a few uh, coming through there. Um, the you, know, you talked about some of the sort of learnings there from the project and the importance of that bottom up approach. Were there any sort of recommendations that you'd have uh, from the projects that others could learn from in terms of maybe at a policy level or uh, what you think could could actually benefit other schemes into the future or indeed um, policy measures? Um, it's a good question. I, I guess if if I was to give any um, advice, sometimes people wait to have that public meeting until they have all the answers. You know, nobody wants to stand up and not have the answers. I do think uh, having a public meeting early to get the questions which are going to guide your answers is actually as important as having all everything laid out before mm. you start. I think um, probably the best piece of advice is never fall in love with the project plan because it is going to go out the window the minute you actually start to implement it. Like, um, to be flexible is key, definitely. Um, and to take on differences of opinion as well that, you know, um, I, I think the blackface sheep is a good example of <clears throat> maybe one of the ways that, that we changed, like the steering committee had thought that was the way to go. But then we're talking to the farmers, we realised, no, there is actually benefit to other breeds of sheep in this area as well. So, um, and the importance of that, and, that, yeah. that relationship with the funding agency as well, that they are prepared to be, I suppose, agile or, or exactly. responsive to, to those changes along the way. Uh, that seems to be a, 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 a big difference in, in the, the, the EIP approach, the operational group approach, uh, where, where um, you know, you're keeping keeping that dialogue open, which are your funder, I suppose, is important. Mm -hmm. um, Catherine, we have some very nice questions coming in from our, our audience. Yeah, and very nice compliments. Just a couple of uh, kind of key key things that came through there. Very encouraging for the future of farms in the West. And um, another nice one, acknowledging the people and their heritage and impact over millennia on the on the landscape is a good start. So you have a few good things there. Uh, could one very quick one there? I know you showed the photos, but the question was, do you use geotagged photos or was it just with the photos the farmers sent in to show they had the fencing done? I mean, there's, a, there's an element of trust. Like, um, we know the areas we would walk the land before, and so we know if that field is where we agreed yeah. that the, the fence would would be put. There was no need for um, overly okay. complex. Yeah, uh, no, no right. we we just had to. Um, That's lovely. Yeah, I'll keep moving here. Um, and just a small comment there going around the fencing. Um, a question about how fencing improves habitat condition. It can in certain areas, and it is it is a good question. Um, if you remember back to the a slide I showed with the payments, um, that farmer was on a shoreline. So when you let animals near water, you can be impacting the water quality. It could be a riparian bank, or it could be um, like the, we we uh, operated in areas of mocker grass, which um, we needed to ensure that. Um, say some of the herd wasn't going right up until that area. So fencing off areas, fencing off water in particular. Um, and again, just that term, good fences make good neighbours, you know, <laughs> having those boundaries as well is, is important. I think essential for stock control, isn't it, if you're trying yeah. to graze the areas right. So yeah, no, no, it's just a, a nice clarification there. Just go back, a good few on the um, on the invasives. Did you do anything on Japanese knotweed? No. Um, no. Again, yes, farmers would have on their own land, but as um, a, a, when we have the operatives, uh, we just concentrate it on the um, the rhododendron. Yeah, and any option for control of rhododendron on organic farms who can't use herbicides? Yeah, this is a real. Uh, I, I think a lot of work needs to be done in this area, and we're. We, as, as the Thuler Project, are very open to, to talking to um, anybody about that. We have done trials. One of the trials was um, stump cutting the rhododendron and covering it with wool, just a raw wool fleece. It worked. Now, um, 
can we say that that's going to work on a broader scale? No, not until we do more trials. Another was using copper nails. Uh, it did knock the plant back, but it didn't kill it. Um, we do have other things that we want to, to test. Um, one is kind of out there. It's, it's a little new and nobody has tried it, but it's called ABA acid or abscisic acid. And this is a natural plant hormone. Um, if you put this on a plant, it automatically knocks it back. It thinks it's in drought. It affects the stomata on the leaf and it respires faster. So it doesn't, it, the plant shuts down, but it doesn't flower. And that, is, as we all know, is what we want to happen with rhododendron. Again, because it hasn't been trialed, it's a difficult one. You, you can't just go out and start spraying in an SAC without fully knowing. So more trials are needed on that. Um, but we do have ideas. Again, because of the area we work in, it's mostly peatlands. We weren't um, going to promote going out and digging it up and, and you know, releasing the carbon from the soil. Um, so we didn't do much mechanical. So um, no areas were done with diggers or. Um, so I, I guess. It's no, an area for looking at. It's an at. area for yeah. Yeah, trials. And, and again, a follow on there when you mentioned the sheep, where I know sheep's wool is. Is a category three animal byproduct by yeah. under the animal byproduct regulations, the ABP. Exactly. But um, <clears throat> do you have to treat the bull in any way when you're using it, or maybe have you faced that challenge? Yet? Yeah. Yeah. Um, currently, I'm, I'm looking at it, it is a, exactly as you said, it's classified as a waste. However, you can get around that um, if you can prove that that waste product has a use, you can get it classified as a byproduct. Um, so if it has a use in its current state and wool, to anybody out there who's listening, if you are planting trees, for example, and you don't want deer to come um, using the raw wool, the, the smell of it, deer don't like that. They don't like the tongue feel. They don't like the lanolin. Um, so it, it it does is supposed to repel deer. I know people say it's, it's not an exact science, but um, if you then do some small treatment on it, you can classify it as a byproduct. So just cold water washing uh, is called cold water suant fermenting and the suant and the lanolin saponifies, it creates a soap, so it cleans itself automatically. Now, I have got testing done on raw fleece to see what's in it, what what can be detrimental to the environment and to humans. So that is all uh, very, very thankful to the Wild Atlantic Nature Life IP. We got 15,000 worth of seed funding. It sounds like a lot of money, but when you get involved labs, it, that money really dwindles very fast. But I thought it was really, really worthwhile to see, can we get wool declassified as a waste product and classified as a byproduct without scouring? Because we all know that's that's not going to work. Fascinating, Sinead. Yeah. Uh, just a couple more questions. Did the project complete any bird monitoring, ground nesting birds? That's a really good question. And I think a very, very insightful um, finding from this is in all our dealing with invasive species, I think there was one bird nest ever found in a rhododendron tree that we were treating. And it was an old nest. There was no nothing in it. Like, um, So th that was one finding. Um, currently, what are, like, as I mentioned, we have a team of, uh, we had 10 operatives on the EIP and they, really what they're doing is kind of scrub management isn't it which would be um of benefit to ground nesting birds we have been in touch with uh, another eip the breeding waders eip and owen murphy there so we're going to work with him to ensure that while we're doing one thing if we can add another feather to the cap wouldn't that be brilliant and we can help owen with training his team so there's going to be a good knowledge swap there so yeah i think that's an area that we're going to improve on but just in the general habitat assessment that you did, there wasn't bird monitoring, I don't think, was there? No, sorry, no. No, not no that's grand. The, and and then the question is, is there still a problem with overgrazing on common areas in Connemara? And did the project help with the recovery? I, I expect it's too soon, but what was your assessment of <coughs> the quality it, it, of the it did. And, yeah. yeah. The, the problems are both, it's not just overgrazing, there's undergrazing as well. So I, I just give the example of like a monoculture again with millennia grass. So when you have sheep, they're not going to eat the millennia. So, you know, we did encourage um, livestock replacement as well. So to encourage cattle to come in there, like the Dexters or the drumming were ideal, the light cattle for those areas. And, you know, the, the way that the difference in how a sh sheep eats and how a, um, a cow eats 
it does help. So um, with the rotational grazing, that that is all something that we would see as very, very important to the uplands and, and controlling that. So with the under, oh, sorry, overgrazing, um, that's when we did the, um, the breeding placement. So we would encourage farmers to breed from ewes that uh, would forage higher in the hills or forage from areas that had scored well on the habitat scorecard. So if they did a, a, a breeding from ewes in those areas, um, it, it helped with the um, overgrazing. And, and that was a lot of work. It was definitely a lot of work. I, I know in particular two farmers, um, Joe Kane and Mary Mannion, they did Trojan work on that and they have seen the difference in, in their, their fields. We've had a few questions uh, here in relation to the biochar element of the project. And, you know, is there a source of information that people could find out more? Um, you know, some people yeah. looking um, to um, maybe avail it for rushes. Um, yes. That bailed, yeah. that bailed. For, it, it's like all, I know it, it, some people are probably thinking this could be the answer to all of our problems with rushes <laughs> and furs and coarse and rhododendron. Um, yes, hopefully. Uh, I do have to apologise because there's a website that I'm supposed to have done, but I haven't had the time yet. But I, uh, the thedoolerproject.com, um, I will be putting up information there about biochar. Um, how we make it and its uses. Um, we are de uh, we've we've had dealings with um Irbia as well. I really think this is an area that we need to expand on with farmers. At, at the moment, everything with doing with biochar is kind of maybe at at a high level. I think we need to bring it into the fields. I think um, and now it is dangerous. I'm not going to say it, it's not the, the temperatures that we we would um create biochar are, are dangerous but in a more controlled manner um i would love to see where there's a mart there's a biochar kiln i i do think you know we should get to people bringing their biomass um or, or having one in a, an area that can be used by a community um we're probably a, a little bit away from that as i say at the currently uh university of limerick have been testing the biochar that we made we wanted to ensure that because we use glyphosate in uh, the rhododendron brash and just rhododendron by itself having granotoxin in it uh, we want to ensure that what we make is a quality product yes. um i i think watch this space and uh, okay. hopefully if i get the time i looked at that website but i do want to do a few leaflets and we'll put it out there as well thanks yvonne uh, that's the forum connemara website there um Great, great. Um, look, I'm uh, sorry we have to finish so early because I and we you, you had uh, some more time. If uh, we had some more time, we'd lo love to have heard more on the slides uh, on the presentation because uh, you know there's such a rich uh, findings from the project and uh, the fact that you had people involved from the get go, and that's what I love about these operational groups is that. You know that bottom up approach to it so uh, again congratulations to you and the team and uh thanks for for joining us today um catherine thanks for helping out with the the questions and indeed for organizing uh many of the speakers that we're we're having in in the series um and uh yvonne uh maher in the background as well for helping with the, the technology today. Sinead, thanks again, and best of luck with the, the Doula project. And uh, we'd love to have you back, uh, maybe to tell us uh, more about that when, when you're mm -hmm. uh, a little bit more into it, and even even just to, to, to get a sense of what's going on and people so that people can track and, and yeah. see what's, uh, you know, check you out on social media and, and the, the website. And uh, so next week, uh, we're going to be joined by Fergal uh, Monaghan, who is going to be talking to us about non-productive investments as part of the Acres cooperation um, areas. And uh, so uh, Fergal will be giving us an overview of what's, what's happening there. Uh, so do join us next uh, Friday morning. And until then, hope uh, you get to enjoy uh, hopefully uh, not the last of the fine weather, but uh, we'll, we'll knock another few days out of it at least. Um, but uh, enjoy the weekend. Thanks very much. Thank you.